Welcome to another expert cast and today we are going in depth into flipping. I am delighted to be joined by Susanna Cole. Susanna is one of the UK's most successful self-made property investors. Starting her first business at the age of 22, she knew she had an entrepreneurial spirit which could not be constrained by a job. Breaking out of the corporate lifestyle, she followed her dreams and took the risk to set up the good property company which she has now been running for over 10 years. With determination and the right knowledge, Susanna believes anyone can make millions from property. It is possible to succeed even with very little money starting out. It only took Susanna three and a half years to become a property millionaire and, a f and in her first three months as a deal packager, she made £12,000 as a kitchen table startup with a phone, a kettle and a computer. Susanna went on to source, buy or let out more than 200 properties with a value of £45 million and an agreed purchase price of £30 million before refurb. She's then, since then, invested a capital to develop her multi-million pound property portfolio consisting of HMO single lets and serviced accommodation. Uh, Susanna, I know we're gonna focus on flipping. That is an incredible achievement, so congratulations for that. I can well imagine, I can well imagine. For those that might not be familiar with yourself or, or the Good Property Company, um, can you give a little bit more about yourself before you got into property uh, and what made you decide to follow that path? Sure. Um, so I'm head of household, which is a very polite way of saying single parent. It's a, it's a more positive way, I think, because it's owning the responsibility or responsibilities of two, two kids and two hugs, but one big responsibility. Uh, and I've had a, 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 I started out very early running fair trade businesses throughout my 20s. So I grew from a kitchen table startup again to five shops and I was running out uh, at a three and a half ton, ton yellow Dodge van and I was running out, you know, festivals all summer as well as shops. And then I appreciated with a bit of a sort of, all right then, that I probably needed to know some stuff that I didn't know I didn't know. You see what I mean? Um, so I decided to go into corporate life, but I was always going in with a plan, which was I was going to get out as fast as I could again, but but ideally contributing some of my skills and energy and and learning really more professional approaches because I had started without straight from university. Um, and that's what I did. So I, I had four jobs and then came out again into property. Uh, but they were good, you know, they were interesting jobs. Uh, a high growth uh, charity startup in Scotland, which was really a pet project for the First Minister. I worked in economic development in the Kashmir industry in the Scottish borders. So I was sitting at or alongside board level uh, members for 14 different companies. So you very much see how management makes the difference because it's the same product. I, uh, they would kill me if they heard me say that. But what I mean is it's the same imported uh, cashmere from China made into beautiful sweaters and then sold throughout the world. Very much Yves Saint Laurent, Chanel, all of that stuff. So, so what's the difference? The management uh, and the skilled labor force. So that was fascinating to look at a, 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 an industry sector and develop. And then I blagged a job. I, was, I, I ran KISS, the radio station in Bristol, you know, the dance music station. But I'm very uncool. So the very first time Rihanna, I, I saw her in London, she was in our studio. And I just said, who's that? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, um, I was very honoured to be marketing director for the SS Great Britain, which for Bristol is a real icon of the city. So I had four very interesting different jobs that taught me a heck of a lot and hopefully I contributed. But, and I liked them, but I didn't want someone else telling me what to do. I think that's a, a trait of most entrepreneurs, isn't it? That they don't like someone telling them what to do. It's the beauty of it. So then four jobs, a lot going on, as you say, and a lot of learning. And you had a plan, as you say, when you started to leave. So what did the property plan look like before you even started your, your corporate ventures? Oh, it was so cute. Um, I've always loved property. I like all aspects of property. I like the creativity, taking old houses, renovating them. Right now I'm doing a grade two star listed chapel with um, two people buried in it from the 14th century, which is in turning it into a house. Um, so I love all the creativity, but I really like the stability of property. Um, and, and I like the fact that it, it can allow you many, many financial choices, which you wouldn't have in a, in a day job. Um, so I've always 
loved property for almost all its aspects. And so for me, I knew I would be buying property, but I had a plan um, which now is so small, but at the time felt overwhelmingly too large that I could never achieve, which was to buy uh, 20 houses at 100 grand each. I mean, I wrote it down on a, bills, on a business plan thinking that's ridiculous. I will never achieve that. You, you know, where you, somebody tells you at a property event, write down your plan. So, so you do feeling such a fraud. You, you know, how, how on earth could anybody buy a two million pound portfolio? That's bananas. And, and you know, I did. I, I did sort of 1.8 million in the first 18 months while still working full time. So I kind of had an 18 month crossover and then I jumped out of the day job and then I really went for it. I did 43 deals in my first year. I was really annoyed. My target was 60 because I moved into deal packaging. So I'd, I bought seven houses for myself by that point, mainly through private finance because I obviously didn't have a huge amount of money. Um, so uh, I was able to buy very discounted, refinance, pay people back. And then I jumped into property full time and a friend of mine just said, oh, why don't you do deal packaging? You, you can find discounted deals. You can work with investors. So I thought, okay. So I t- set a target of 60 deals and I was very annoyed to have only hit 43 in the first year. And then we roughly did about 50 deals a year there on, there on after. Great numbers. Great numbers, and that does prove that once you write them down, you can you can go and achieve that. Again, writing it down, taking the advice. In terms of then getting, well, I say in terms of getting into property. So um, some people, quite a few people, say, "Well, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and that changed my mindset and so forth." Some people say, "Well, actually, I went on, uh, you know, a three day basic course and those sort of things." Or some people just go and do it. What did that process look like to you? How did that work for you? It started, a, 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 and this may resonate with quite a few people, it started being a weekend uh, a, a weekend trader where you buy your own family home. And I've been head of household since my children were really quite little. So I've had that uh, long, very enjoyable responsibility. So it was me buying the house and I'm quite a family person. So when the children are asleep and I don't really watch much telly, what are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, I'm quite energetic, <laughs> bored now. So I would buy wrecks of houses. I mean, wrecks. And my, my children were too young to be like, mom, you know, so they, they're just like, yay, ice cream. Um, and then when they were asleep, I would just renovate the house in the evening um, because I wouldn't want to go out because the kids were home and they were safe and they were sleeping and it was all very soft and gentle. So here's me. So I did that. I, d- I bought three really beautiful but wrecked old old sort of a little cottage and then a village farmhouse and then, an, then a farmhouse in the country, two with streams, one with an orchard, you know, so the theory, and, and I renovated them and then two and a half years later, I'd sell them again, double the money, go buy the next one, be brutally skint again you know that's a clattish, clattish great british thing to do isn't it yeah, yeah. so i did that for um, and i did that for three houses and each time i doubled double doubled um and, and and a lot of it was was creativity you, you know as well as so i sort of fell into it like i think so many of us do appreciated that actually each time I doubled the value oh sorry the market had allowed me to double the value and I then added additional value by making these very beautiful homes that were very individual you know a colonel's bath and a 1920s this and an 1870 that and scoured eBay and reclamation yards Um, and so I learned two skills uh, for flipping. You've really got two markets. You've either got the cookie cutter, which I then went on to when I was running a, a scaled up business, which is the same bathroom, the same toilet, the same everything. You rinse and repeat. And actually you can do that very quickly. Or I, um, and that for me is mass market for flipping. So rinse and repeat. And it's, it's so efficient because you can buy in bulk. If you've got anything left over of anything, it goes into the next property because you're already buying that one or you're, I mean, at one point I had 30 flips on the go at the same time, which was a little bit full on. So there was no waste because paint and tiles and grout and plaster, everything could go everywhere. You know what I mean? And then the other uh, 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 route to flipping is actually very bespoke. Um, that's my bookkeeper giving me a wee bell. Um, so very bespoke indeed, which is everything's unique and individual. And I found that the British market just adores individualized stuff so in my third one my third house I sold after the Lehman Brothers crashed and after the crash of October 2008 um, and I still nonetheless sold it for a hundred grand more than asking price 
in a major recession and that's because it was so bespoke everything was designed beautifully and had the, all these beautiful old reclaimed everything in it so you've got two routes now the bespoke to me is a is is a a, 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 a thing of love um, and you know I could have either sold it at price or as I did I sold it 100 grand over asking you know I couldn't have expected that a, a month or two after a recession or these the more stable cookie cutter stamp it out rinse and repeat um, and I chose for my flipping strategy a more stable stamp it out rinse and repeat I love the fact you just touched on one of the key, key questions I actually had written down uh, of, of having two strategies within within flipping so just for people that might not be aware of what flipping is it is buying a property adding value selling it for a profit yes spot on as fast as possible for um and and price is either well it's a combination of speed and uh, cash isn't it so um it's and this was this was the useful thing about having been a retailer with five shops I'd, i ran fair trade businesses in my 20s is that you learned about stock turn and it's not just about well i've bought it for a pound and I've sold it for two it's well, if you do that once a year, you make a quid. If you do that 12 times a year, you make an awful lot more. So it's about stock turn. So I was very, and shops have um, a different sections. You know, the front of the shop, you expect a much faster stock turn than the back of the shop. So I was already versed in almost being a retailer. So I've always viewed a flipping strategy as literally retailing houses. And, and if you think about retailing houses, if you think about it being a nice shop, you then start thinking about all the seven P's, price, place, positioning, packaging, uh, promotion. So then you think about your display and your marketing rather than, and I'm going to be terribly rude and I'm sorry about this, men, because I don't really mean it in quite the way I'm saying it, but I'm not sure how many of you actually buy design magazines. It's more like, you know, you'd be reaching up and you'd be asking to put it in a, a brown paper bag, all secret, but you blokes out there, listen up. <laughs> Um, you guys sell sheds you sell beautiful dovetail joints um, but at the same time you sell houses with no soul with no lampshades no curtains and no love and she makes the decisions normally when it comes to home you might you know and therefore you need to understand your retailing um excuse me i'm being pinged uh, forgive me um so you need to understand you're being you're retailing and so i think that retail background was really quite helpful oh, they always say a woman's touch is way more advantageous or something along those lines uh, you know it's uh, and it, it is so true as well and um, Great, don't worry about offending people, it's absolutely fine. It's, uh, you know, it's, 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 on, it's, it's honest, that's the thing. And that's what this is about as well. It's, you do need that approach. So if someone's getting, into, someone's getting into flipping and you've touched upon two strategies, would you say that if someone's looking to focus um, in, in, in flipping, would they go down the cookie cutter approach or could they start with a boutique approach? What are the pros and cons of starting with each one? Um, a, a, a cookie cutter, I mean, you get into your cookie cutter once you, I like the cookie cutter for safety for somebody starting, to be quite frank with you. I would prefer to guide somebody to safety. Um, so that the, the, if we go back to the bespoke, um, uh, those can be driven by ego, either your own ego, like look at this beautiful thing I've created, or it's driven by the ego of the person buying it. You, you know, I must have this. It's a one-off. I want to beat. And it's often about beating the competition. Well, that's great as long as you've got enough people to compete against each other. Um, so in that ha price, uh, that house where I sold it for 100 grand over asking, I actually only had two people competing and I never told the buyer because I thought they'd feel terrible. I had one person, I think from memory, bid 30 grand over asking price and the other person bid 100 grand over asking price. So they, they perceived that they were in competition and they just put in a crazy bid because they're, and I mean this nicely, their ego, their, this is my home, this belongs to me before I've actually bought it meant I'm prepared to whack down a huge bid, 70 grand over the other person to beat the competition. So if you can engender a competitive, if, if you're in a marketplace where there's a, there are, a, you are sure there's enough competitors and you've got a top end product, then you can get crazy ego whack downs of cash like that. So that's great. So make sure your product is really in demand and speak to your estate agents to make sure the price point that you're looking to charge um, is, is, is 
is is competitive, not in a cheap way, but would allow people to really bid on it and then make sure that there are enough people that the you know your whole location, the desirability, the whole atmosphere of the house, not just the house itself, but where it's sited, where it, you know what are the other things that make this property so in demand? And it could be in a city schools, it could be location, it could be the right side of the street, south facing garden. You know, it's it's about prestige. So the one off is about. And I mean this kindly, prestige, ego, and beating the competition. So you've got to make sure those elements are there in that flipping strategy. And my God, you know, someone paying a hundred grand over, over the price that a house is actually worth is a delightful place to be on a very regular basis. But it's a binary strategy. It either works or you just get the price that it was going to be anyway. You know, whereas a cookie cutter strategy is almost you're, you're stabilizing risk, you're smoothing out risk because you're going to do a lot more of them. Um, and the cookie strategy for me is a, a mid range price point that um, what, what do the politicians talk about? You know, the, the, the average family in the street sort of thing. But basically, the majority of people would be able to afford. I'm not saying everybody could, but a kind of 250 in the South. I'm in Bristol, a 250 to 350 strategy, a thousand pound purchase price for a house not everyone can afford that but great great swathes of the population can and and therefore what you're then looking for is you're looking for mass numbers of people wanting to get your house and your house is simply 10 percent better than the other houses not a hundred percent better than the other houses in its unique ability so you just touched on a couple of things. So number one, you're based in the southwest in, in Bristol, a lovely part of lovely part of the country. Uh, secondly, location, location, location. I, I, I probably get in trouble for saying that because I think that's a trademark. But you know, um, would you say then it's again focus on the getting started that you've just got to do a lot of research, speak to the right people, agents, etc., and then find out what what that sweet spot is, given everything that you've said. Is that right? Yeah, I don't think it even takes that much research. You know, what's the average salary within your location? You know, look that up on Wikipedia. Um, what's the population in your location? How many houses of the type that you intend to sell are currently being sold right now? And then how many state agents firms are there in the location? I can tell you this stuff. Even now, there's 6,408 houses being sold last time I checked on Rightmove within Greater Bristol. And that I only checked last week. Last time we did our list of estate agents, there were 288 estate agents in Bristol. Do you see how I've got the data? So I think it's quite important to, even though I love creativity, of course I do, but um, I, draw, I run a very data-driven business. So I've got, and there's a 440,000 population in Bristol. So there's the fluidity and I like people to have a fluidity of at least 250,000 because you've got enough buyers, enough sellers, you know, enough renters if it goes wrong. So there's your bigger picture. And then let's go into the detail. And you're going to pick this up really quickly once you run a flipping strategy. So here's some real critical little things. Um, cars. Now, um, I like cars as much as another human being, but I don't know huge amounts about them. Um, but I do know when a car looks old or when a car looks new. So a street that's got a whole bunch of old cars, that's typically going to be a letting street. And you're just going to pick that up through experience. A street that's got a whole bunch of new cars is typically going to be an owner occupier street. And then go back to common sense. Do people who buy houses tend to want to live beside rental properties? No. Um, they tend to want to live beside other owner occupiers and feel that there's a, a community there of what you might term like-minded people. It, you know, you, you could say what you think about that judgment that people make that nonetheless seems to be the way. So you'll get certain streets slowly develop into rental streets and certain streets slowly develop into but uh, uh, owner occupier streets and typically in a flipping strategy you ideally want to be in the owner occupiers and your fastest shortcut is check the cars if they're old they're rental if they're new they're probably on lease and uh, they're owner occupied it's dead simple and that's what i love about it is you've made it sounding incredibly simple and getting out and about doing it yeah it's just a case of it it's, it turns into a mental game doesn't it it's you've got to oh, mindset. You can do it. Yeah, you can. 
And yeah. this, I mean, I know, I know people sort of say, oh, you know, but if I could do it, anybody could do it. Now, I'm quite data focused. I'm, I, I work quite hard. Um, uh, these days, I'm, you know, you talked about loving travel. Me too. I do 183 days work and I do huh, 182 days travel and spend time with people I love, particularly my parents are in their 70s and my sister out in, in Brooklyn in New York and travel around and explore new countries. Um, but, but in the early days, I did work pretty hard and and people it absolutely can be done but you know you're not going to be doing nine to five as you're setting up either a flipping strategy or as you're setting up a a, a buy to let strategy and I use flipping in order to fund my buy to let um, but frankly if I can do it anybody can do it and I've taught people for a long time somebody years ago asked me then and I found I love it and what I find fascinating and slightly ego denting which is great is it's not all about me <laughs> damn it um, it's actually statistical statistics so my mentees when they do the same input of work if you want to be as giddy as that they get the same output of results and that's really interesting to me because it's not it's not then saying oh only certain people can do this it's about if i make so many phone calls to find a discounted property it's 100 phone calls 25 viewings 21 offers between one and two deals if i uh, uh, try and buy how many auction properties and for me i've measured it for years it's i get i buy one in four properties i try and buy so for every time I go to auction, I always try and buy four houses. I'll come away with one. Once we went to buy 30 houses, we came away with seven. So again, the maths work. So do you see what's the beauty about no, the beauty about the fact I've done so many deals is I've measured. And then because I've mentored and worked with so many other people and workshops and stuff like that, I've also seen their maths. So I've not only got my own maths, I've got everybody else's maths. And frankly, they're identical. So basically, if you do the work, you'll get the outcome. And, you know, so that means anybody can do it if they're prepared to put the work in, take the right steps, they'll get the outcome, which is, which is a rather nice thought, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. There's no point sitting around complaining and crying about things not going your way. If you're then not putting the work in, it, doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. You've got to go and put the work in. You touched upon... Uh, the greater Bristol area because some people might be listening to this thinking well you know can this if I'm just starting can this work in London can this work in you know Reading where I'm from can this work in Bristol can this work in Sunderland sounds to me like it can work pretty much anywhere as long as your approach is as long as your approach is there is that, is that correct yeah and I want people to look for a 20% markup so if the whole thing just to keep it super easy if everything you like cost of interest, the cost of the renovation, the cost of the lawyer, the cost of the estate agent if you're using one, but actually why would you do that? Because you can all sell it yourself and say you've got a lot of money. Um, uh, when you, you, well, I'm just saying you can. It costs a photographer, the cleaner, you know, everything. If it costs 100 grand or your taxes, then you want to be selling it for uh, 120. So times the total cost of the project by 1.2. So the critical thing, of course, the biggest cost is always the property. So you've got to be able to find the property discounted. So I've had people right across the country use the same strategy, um, it, it, no matter where they are. You've got to be aware of your local area, um, have enough of fluidity. So, you know, selling in a village of 5,000 people, I'd be kind of nervous. I'd want, personally, I'd want a lot more fluidity. I like towns and cities because you've got more buyers. You've got more sellers, more buyers, more movement. If plan A doesn't happen, you can always pop in plan B and plan C. And then it's a 20% markup. Do you see? Cookie cutter. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, and yeah, a lot of this and a lot of the you know things in this series do come down to mindset and that is you know that that's crucial in terms of buying with discount is that is that golden rule number one for the cookie cutter approach is always buy with discount or could you buy at normal price but find a way that other people aren't adding value or is that more of a boutique approach which we'll touch upon in a bit that's boutique approach and i think you're taking a risk um so uh, I always want people to buy discounted or wholesale or below market value. I like to think of it as wholesale because we all understand wholesale. And one or two houses, you get, see, I'm going back to maths, one or two houses in 100 is sold wholesale. Um, and there are four ways to get them, auctions, estate agents, or director vendor, um, director house. Um, so whether the vendor's a residential vendor or a landlord vendor. So I always want people to buy discounted because that starts to build in a safety 
gap. Yes, you can. I mean, one of my friends, uh, Chris, made a hundred grand flipping a project because she added a uh, planning permission. She didn't actually build the project, and actually, the project made two hundred grand because her and her and she didn't actually put her cash into the project. Her JV partner did, and they added value by getting planning. But um, uh, generally, I like people to buy discounted because that just gives you some safety. And then if you want to add extra, amazing, do that. You know, but, but don't go, oh, I'm going to add value because what happens if you can't get the planning? You know, or what happens if, say, the market drops a little bit and now you've overpaid? So I like, I like some safety margin to be in there before, before you even start. And I got this strategy from something I did myself. And then I went, hang on, you could really scale this up. So I recently, um, I own a, a, a couple of ex-cancer houses. Um, and, you know, often ex-cancer houses are very nice side uh, gardens and very large gardens to the side. Like enough that you could put another house in it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know what's coming. So I spent a grand and a half. I had a very good architect. Grand and a half was all I spent, including my application fees to Bristol City Council. I got planning for a two-bed house for uh, in in the garden. And you can imagine people bite your arm off for that kind of plot. And I sold it. I had about twenty people trying to buy it for seventy-five grand. So we got 75 grand for a piece of garden. Now that's great if you've got the garden and the house, but what if you don't have the garden and the house and you don't have much money? And all I did was split the garden off. It's a rental property anyway. And so I split the garden off before those tenants even moved in. So they've never felt they've lost anything. And I spent a grand and a half and I got 75 grand. Delicious. You do that all day long, wouldn't you? But what if you had no cash to, or very little cash to start with? Well, People in those kind of houses, not always, of course, but sometimes they won't have set aside enough money for their pensions. You know, they will have a financial need. And also, these are huge gardens. They don't necessarily need such a big garden as they're getting older. It's actually a bit of a burden. So what if you did a lease option with an owner, and, which is, and lease options are, uh, for me are for planning. They're not for residential houses. And if you said to the owner, look, I've got a solution here. We put, um, I'll fund the planning and we split the project 50-50. You don't need to do anything except for, except uh, your garden's going to be reduced, which means you've got less grass cutting to do and you're going to receive 50% of the profit. I'll now do that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> numerous times. I mean, I did 50. Yeah. So you're putting in grand and a half. That's what you're risking. Mm -hmm. And you're getting 50% of the uplift. And the beauty about these kind of uh, communities is they're genuine communities. So if you do a good job for the first person, they're going to recommend you to their mates who are probably same age range, same social economic background and live just around the corner because you've already done a great job for them. So, so as you develop your, uh, your finding ability, it becomes easier and easier. Now try and scaling that up to aiming to make it a million quid just for fun. You could do that. Don't see why not. Absolutely, anything. Nothing's impossible. Hmm. Give me a good idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, that's so that's a different. I mean, I love creating houses. I love. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I love renovating houses and 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 you know building houses and developing houses and splitting houses to flats. But this is a very low entry point to flipping because I think people need to think about flipping as not just I get an old house, I make it look nice and I sell it again. How about I, I don't do any renovation? How about I do joint ventures with people who own land and I flip land as well? Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and it was, it was on my question. It was actually on my questions list as well to, to dive into the different aspects because when people mention flipping that is that preconception is let's take this two or three mid uh, mid terraced house lick of paint add some value here and there sell it job done but what you're saying which is great and true is well yeah you can flip but you don't have to buy the thing you could do it by adding value through planning uh, give us some um, if you can give us some more examples of, of similar things like that that you've you've done just so people can be aware of what is achievable when they're looking to get into this Sure. Well, I did quite a lot of my flips through joint ventures because uh, like anybody, I didn't have enough money to do all the projects I wanted to do. Um, so, uh, um, 
oh, I've, I've, I've put my case studies downstairs because I always like to just double check my numbers to make sure they're bang on. Uh, I just came upstairs for the internet, but I think we're fine for the internet now. So let me just grab them. So uh, this is a really nice joint venture where we both made quite a lot of money, which was super, excuse me. I'm just a fact girl, you see. So I, I like to just make sure I've got the maths correct because... It's, it's detail, isn't it? So how about this one? This was a JV, so we didn't put any money into this one. And the partner was actually cash. We bought two flats for 300. It was a tired landlord. One was 130 and one was 170. We spent 13,800 in total. So those are really fast refurbs, six grand and 7.8. That's really just a bit of a new kitchen, some new carpets and a bit of a paint, really. And then we sold them individually for 420, 175 and 245. So 300 purchase, 13,800 between the two flats and sold at 420. How nice is that? We put no cash into that and we split the profit 50-50. And now we did a lot of stuff like that. Um, and, and, and I think joint ventures, although you've got to be mindful of, of all the um, JV qualification and obviously doing it correctly with paperwork and of course, but joint ventures can be a really great way to go if you're wanting to develop up the scale of your flipping, but again, don't have enough cash to be able to do that. Or how about another one, um, which is a commercial, a semi-commercial, semi-residential. And um, what we did was bought an old shop with a flat above that was just knackered, you know, in the, in the classic, it's knackered. And we got planning permission to split it into two flats we had to as part of the uh, the, the the conditions so it was um it was actually um pre uh, living i forgot the exact word of it but pre uh, before somebody's allowed to move in we had to install the smallest solar panel you've ever seen in your life i mean it was to be honest, it was a, just a piece of nonsense. I mean, I'm, I'm well up for solar panels, but let's, if the council's going to make me install one, make me install a proper one, you know? <laughs> but anyway, um, so it was an old flat with a shop. It was totally knackered, totally run down. We got planning to split the title. We split the title. We got planning to split it into two flats. We had to it obviously put in things like sewage and, you know, to work, work with all the services, fill refurb. We created a management company and we sold with the flats. You know, so that was quite nice. And we bought it for 180. The refurb was 75 and we sold it for 341 uh, collectively, the two flats. Although one was sold to one person and one was sold to another person. You know, so you, you can kind of tidy things up. They're a little bit raggedy around the edges and change of use as well, can't you? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I was thinking on, on that note as well. A common thing that I hear when people are getting started in property is... The, it's probably, again, I'm, I guess it's more of a confidence thing, is when we're talking about finding joint venture finance or finding partners, yeah, people might think, well, if I've got this potential project for £200,000, for argument's sake, uh, a lot of people do say, well, who's going to invest, you know, it's my first one, who's going to invest in me for £200,000? What would your advice be to the people that are thinking along those lines? How would you how would you go about that? How did you raise your finance? Understandable, because that's a, that whole imposter syndrome, and um, and I would sort of relate back to them. I had done about twenty three million pounds worth of deals, and I still didn't call myself a property investor. So I kind of relate to that, you know. And it was on a skiing holiday where somebody said, "What do you do?" And I was like, "Ooh." I'm a property investor, you know, and then nobody corrected me. But the reality was I'd done about 23 million quids, you know, so that's that weird little crabs out of bucket nonsense. You know, if crabs are trying to climb out a bucket, they try and climb over each other and pull each other back down. That's, that's imposter syndrome. Redefine yourself and just say it with pride, honey. But, but also they're not, they are investing in you to, to figure out, are you an honest, decent, hardworking person? But they're also significantly investing in the deal. So those Southfield flats, in fact, the, 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 um, the shop to, to, to uh, flats, that was also a JV with a super guy that we're still very good friends with. But, you know, those Southfield flats that were bought for 300 and sold, was it 450? You know, we did 20, uh, 45 pieces of research to show our investor what we anticipated the sale price. To, yeah, sorry, 420s. Bought for 300, sold for 420, 13,800 refurb. I mean, who wouldn't bite your arm off for a deal like that? And we did 45 pieces of research on a deal, 10 page deal report to make sure that we were pretty secure that the end value would be the end value. So I look at 20 solds, 
20 on the market and you just look through right move and zoopla for that and then for at least five estate agent opinions so by the time you talk you're presenting to a jv partner to once you've qualified them and saying look we've got you know we're the kind of people that do these kind of deals you've got quite good evidence because you've had, you know, you're terrified about getting it wrong. So you've had to evidence it to yourself anyway. So you're just showing them the same research. So it's, it's about research and data. And, and two things can happen. Uh, well, three, you get it right and you both made a lot of money. Fabulous. You get it wrong um, and you get it wrong. Now, you're less likely to get it wrong the more numbers you do. If you take three houses and say, I think it's going to sell for 400 grand because those three houses sold for 400 grand, you got, you got like, you got a huge likelihood of getting it wrong. If you take 45 houses, the likelihood of you getting it wrong is reduced enormously. So I think it's again, a numbers game. And then, so, so, I mean, you, you might get it wrong occasionally and I'm sure we have got it wrong. I don't know of any cases where we ourselves got the research wrong um, because I always think, well, we did a lot of research, but um, or the marketplace just doesn't respond. And we've definitely had that. Now that sounds like I'm son, trying to absolve myself of blame. I'm, I'm not. Um, but each time it was like, you go back to your research and you go, but we did 45 bits of research. I don't understand. But every now and again, a buyer just won't materialize. At the time that you are selling that particular product, nobody wants it. You know, and you're like, damn, that's <laughs> a shame. In, in, those, in those situations, I think this is what people might be fearful of is, well, if I do all that work and this happens and then no one buys it uh, and I've got X amount of JV financing, it's like, oh my God, what's going to happen? So for, for people that are thinking that, what, how have you reacted in those situations when it's not been as smooth as possible? Uh, calmly. Um, my JV partners have occasionally reacted calmly and occasionally reacted in a, should we just call it non-calm situation? And I find that fascinating observation of human nature she says now i found it deeply upsetting at the time <laughs> um, so one of the things i always do when i uh, when i work with jv partners is have the conversation in advance and say look something could go wrong so first off we put it in the jv partner's name not mine um so they own it we've got a restriction against it so when we're flipping it it's in their name and and i have i have a totally separate conversation with them that says listen like all of this property stuff it's all hot and sexy if we make money but the reality is it might go wrong and we might overspend either from screw ups you know but more likely because you get into the roof and something terrible is there or you lift up the floorboard and there's dry rot you know so there could be an overspend from budget and um, there could be the marketplace drops there simply could be no buyer at the right time these things may well happen so are you still okay with that now the jv partners say yes and and then we also talk about if they happen this is what we would do you know, so when I do a flipping strategy, I always have four weeks. I know my three price points and I know my time frames before I even open the market it up to the market. So I'll know in a rising or a strong market, I'll only have it on the price point, a certain price point for four weeks, then I'll drop it for two weeks, drop it for two weeks, then I'll rent it. So the maximum exposure of a property not making money is eight weeks. So I'll talk that through with the JV partner in advance and I'll say, are you happy that if it doesn't sell, you're going to own this property, you're going to refinance it, you're going to rent it out, because obviously we've already looked at the rental yield, the plan B, you know, and you're going to get, you know, whatever mortgage you're going to get, a RICS valuation. And then for us as the JV partner, I mean, it would, we'd earn more money if we stayed in, but I view a JV partnership as in and out, you know, in terms of a flip. So when, then we'll get paid our profit out of what, whatever the RICS valuation was. Are you happy with that? Yes, they say. And then when it comes to it, um, some are and some aren't. Um, and, and that's when you have to navigate and breathe a little bit, thinking, I bloody told you this. <laughs> and you just go, okay, uh-huh. You know, because obviously in their mind, they've mentally sold it already. And, you know, they've already banked the cash mentally. Um, and I'm okay about navigating risk and things going wrong and just laughing. But but that's because I'm really experienced in property. So I know that just when you're down property, or she'll just do for you one, you know, and it's like, oh, you're just a comedy little monkey property. But if it's your first or second project and it is not going to plan as a JV partner, that's, uh, and that, uh, that's scary for them. And sometimes when people are scared, they fight or flight. 
And when they fight, they can be frustrating because you're like, guys, this is a risk. I told you it was a risk at the beginning. You're not trying to pretend it's not your risk, you know, but, but we're in this together as entrepreneurs, but then they forget and they're like, but, but you promised. And you're like, no, 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 let's just go back. Let's just, let's just take it gently. And, and, and that is a risk. So if anybody's thinking I'm going to JV, there, you're not going to have 100% smooth sailing either because of the project or because of the relationship. Um, so try and stay as graceful as possible. Make sure everything's legally above board, of course, and make sure all worst case scenarios are discussed, which allows the relationship to navigate stormy weather because property is a risk and people need to really get that. And I like the fact you have to qualify JV partners. You have to make sure they're high net worth or sophisticated because that allows them, if you like, a bit more more stomach to, to be able to navigate the risks as well. Let's, let's quickly uh, touch on that process. So qualifying JV partners. So what would you need to do? I've got a property. I need £200,000. I need to go and find an investor. What process would you do in order to, number one, find someone and then number two, qualify them once you've found them? Uh, so what I learned was, um, say, say, say it was you. It, it's or shall, should we say it's me and I'm and you've got the money? Yeah, that sounds <laughs> okay. great. Sounds so, great. Yes. So you're sat with the cash, and I'm like, oh, could I have some, please? And what I would not do is go, hey, let's look at this project because what will happen is you're you will forget about the relationship with me. You'll then just be like, yeah, let's do the project. And then what will then then start our uh, eyes start getting starry. Do you see what I mean about how much cash we could make? Whereas actually, um, even if I had a project and I was desperate for the cash, and I've definitely had that in the earlier days where you're just like, oh my God, will somebody fund this because it's really profitable and I haven't got any money. Um, I, don't, I don't bring the project out. I talk about past deals. I talk about future deals. I talk about the theory of working together so that the principle the general broad verbally agreed relationship principle is agreed first. But before you even do that with anyone who's JV, you have to look at PS 13 forward slash three, and you have to make sure they're either high net worth or, um, or a sophisticated investor. Now I'm not dumb, you know, got an MBA and all the rest of it, but I cannot figure out to the, a sophisticated investor to the point I could stand in a court of law and say, yes, you're on, I totally get it. You know, and so I just go for high net worth, which is a quarter of a million pound assets, not in your own family home or insurance policy or hundred grand a year income. And I want to see proof of that before I can ever offer them a deal. Um, I can talk to them about deals that I'm not going to JV with. They might want to, you know, but I can't, I cannot offer them a, a 50-50 split because obviously that's a little bit more risky. So they need to really understand money in the first place, which is, you know, evidencing that they're high net worth. Um, so, so I would need to talk to them about the theory about joint venturing. They'd be like, oh, oh so you'd be like, Sue's brilliant. I've got all this money. And I'd be like, great. But first, let's qualify you because I can't tell you about this deal. And it's a good one, by the way, until you've been qualified. And I do a quantitative and a qualitative qualification process. Said that all in a fat one. And then I can go, hey, now let's talk about this deal. And I don't get, I don't get worried. If you don't take this deal, even though behind the scenes, I'm like, oh my God, please take it. You know, paddling like mad underneath. I just use it as an opportunity for you and I to, to, to further our relationship, for me to understand what you like about the deal, what you don't like about the deal. Not for you to become a prima donna, um, not I'm suggesting you would, but just to generally understand your investing thinking. And, and then I'll say to you, look, if you don't want to go for this deal, why don't we have a call in two weeks time? I need to get this deal sold first and then we can pick up because then you've seen that I'm doing real stuff. I've understood why this deal doesn't work for you and perhaps we might work on another one. So qualify them before you present a deal to them. Don't, don't dangle the deal because then they forget who you are and they forget who they are and they just chase after the shiny penny and agree the principle of the relationship and then introduce the deal, even if you're desperate to get a deal sold. And, and then uh, hypothetically speaking, of course, we're doing this on a, uh, you know interview, podcast, so forth. Uh, I'm trying to think back in go back to the early days. So you've got a great reputation now. So you know, I imagine that people are sort of flocking to you with, oh, I've got X, Y, and Z, can we do something? But back in the early days, how would you have found someone? 
How would you have found someone back in the early days? Oh, I cleaned up. I'm telling you. Right. So Simon Zutzi is a good guy. And he had two really nice humans called Ben and Barry who ran Bristol Pin at the time. And they did such hard work. And they really did. They, they put on this event. There was like between 50 and 70 people coming into the room. And I'm just a little go for it kind of a girl. So, you know, you know and I didn't know very much, but I knew I, want, I, knew I was going to make stuff happen in property and I knew I had a business plan it was going to happen even though I didn't really believe it even though I did but I didn't but I did you know what I mean inside you're like still feeling a bit hollow about everything and so I would literally what, what I think mistake people make is they go to a property event they think that's it I'm going to create relationships on the night and I didn't because I'd been working at the SS Great Britain and my job was marketing director but when I got given the job they went oh by the way <laughs> you're also doing fundraising what <laughs> so I learned and there was an amazing fundraiser there called Vanessa. I mean, stunningly good at her job. So I learned from the best. I was technically her boss, but really, frankly, she was just hugely competent. And I learned that it's all about light touch relationship. I mean, you know, there's in, uh, you know, I went to meetings for the Institute of Fundraisers. You know, I really learned the skill of fundraising. So everyone else would be in there going, I've got to meet three people and get heavy with them tonight. And I'd be like, no, I am collecting every single business card in this room. And so I would, I would butterfly the room. Uh, you know, I'd meet some really cool people. I'd write down and meet like, like I'd write down what color jumper you're wearing, for example. You might write down that I'm wearing a pink dress if you were collecting cards. And then I'd say, listen, I would love to talk to you. My job today is to collect business cards, but I would love to have a conversation with you. How are you fixed for Tuesday at five? Thank you so much. Speak to you then. Look forward to it. Good luck off I went. So I would just zoom the business cards up, basically collecting the database. Let's be quite frank with it. Thank you, Simon. Good guy. And then I would follow up with every single person. So I knew that 5% was in the room and 95% was the one-to-one -one follow up. So for every event that I went to, I'd, I'd put between 10 and 20 hours in the diary for follow-ups. And I cleaned up in that room. I, t I took not all the money out of the room, but I was a little hoover. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm dead honest, you know, to be honest with you. And, and every time I took money, I'd, I'd, I'd get a frog in my throat. And, I, you, you know, you're so nervous, your throat constricts and you almost can't breathe. And, um, and it, was, it was only when, it, and, and you just have to honor someone else's money more importantly than yours. And it was only when I almost became, and please don't think I sound like a, but it was only when I got so used to doing flips and having things go right and wrong that I started to downgrade, I started to go, I started to da downgrade my enormous sort of nurse's matron respect for my JV partners. I was a bit more like, guys, come on, you know, come on, we're in this room together. If you, you know, if you can't stand the heat, don't be in the kitchen. And as soon as I had that kind of thinking in my head, I thought I got to stop JVing with people because actually for me, this is like the 70th deal I've done or the 140th deal I've done. For them, it's the third. And if you can't wholly respect that experience, Susanna, you've got to just take a rest because you, they, they, they haven't been bashed around by property like you have, you, you know, it's kind of in terms of bobbing on a canoe. So you've got to really respect that for them, this is brand new and scary, whereas for you, it's, it's you know, something going wrong is just something to laugh about and then solve. You know what I mean? Whereas someone else will have a massive panic attack. And that's when I stopped doing JVs because I didn't want to ever not respect the other person to the, the highest degree, if you see what I mean. So I think being scared is a good thing. It definitely brings out the best in you. I, I mean, I can think of you know, numerous conversations I've had with investors over the years and they've not been the greatest conversations in terms of, in terms of good news. And yes. it, it, it is what it is. Yeah, we're lucky that... I found that from the back of sort of some of the negative conversations or based around bad news, it's actually brought out an even better relationship because people respect yes. you even more for doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does, that, does that resonate with you for things you've found over it, Largely, yes. And I've got this theory that um, largely, yes. Uh, I've been through some, some right tough moments with some people and that has forged, you know, lifelong friendships because you think, you know, you can handle this, you're respectful in difficult times, you're fabulous. You know, you're an all-round great human. And then 2%, in my view, you know, with my portfolio of tenants, I think 2% of the human, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but my view is 2% of the human race are interesting. 
you know, and I find this with my tenant population. So if somebody's behaving in a interesting manner, we just go, ah, 2%. And 2% of, of, um, of, of investors are also, should we call them interesting? So I've also had, a, a, you know, a couple of situations where you think, I think I really don't want to work with you again. And I think we're going to try and get out of this as fast as we can uh, with everybody just breathing, <laughs> you know. And I think you just have to ride that through to the end and say, thank you very much, goodbye. So I have found two types of investors, if you want to call it veto, to not work with. One's a non-committal, and that's the heartbreaking because you've got an amazing deal. They, you can see they're going to make money, and they just can't get in, but nor can they say no either. So they kind of, they almost dangle their inability to decide. You mentally are going, yeah, they're in, because you couldn't conceive of why they wouldn't be, because clearly they're going to make a lot of money. And then at the last minute, they tell you not to. Um, so what I create, I mean, I, I once was buying a property at au a pre-auction. The auction was at seven o'clock. I was actually getting on a plane, literally an easy jet flight at three in the afternoon. I was literally on the bottom step of the, of the, of the plane when a text came through. It was two brothers telling me they were pulling out of the pre, the, 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 the auction, the pre-agreed auction. We were buying it pre, so we we're taking it out of the room. It was an amazing deal. And I had between the bottom of the step and the top of the step just to decide to sod it. I'm going to put the exchange money over anyway and then find a new JV partner when I got off the flight in Glasgow. So I had quite a worried flight in Glasgow. So those are not the non-committals. They will never be able to get off. Now, I made a lot of money out of that deal. And it's a shame for those brothers that they pulled out. So you've got to get rid of those people fast because they're going to give you an agonizing flight from Bristol to Glasgow. And then the other ones are the prima donnas. And... And I mean this with a, a sort of either a kindness or a gentleness. Um, they're going to take a tantrum. They're going to ask you how high are you going to jump. They don't want you working with anybody else. And and think about a child, a two-year-old who's who's either overtired or gone to a party, or eaten too much sugar, or had an ice cream taken away from bad behaviour. They're going to have a right little strop. And your prima donnas are not going to terminate the relationship gracefully, but they're going to have a right little strop. Now, we didn't have many of them. We had a, we had a very small number, and it's quite a painful experience to go through. Um, and you just have to breathe through it and just wait until the tantrum's over and you can hand over everything gracefully and wish them good luck. So I'm not trying to put people off. All I want to do is people to know the whole picture um, and try and eliminate from your investor database, your, anybody who behaves in that way before you do a deal with them. Because once you're in a deal, you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know? So just try and observe that behavior first. I don't know if, did you have any of that kind of stuff? Um, not to the level that you've just explained it. Um, I think really when, well, excuse my French, when the shit hits the fan, that's when you find out people's true colors. Oh yeah, don't you? React. Um, so no, nothing on nothing on your level. We've had a few people that have been concerned a few times about things that have gone wrong, you know, valuations not being as high, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and thankfully, the couple of times that's happened, the people have had a, a generic understanding of property. So it's been a bit easier to explain because they understand that that can happen. Um, yeah, it's, it's all about the long term relationships. We know that we'll still be doing this twenty, thirty years time, etc. So at some point, it's it's going to work out. Um, yes. Yeah. Interesting, because I saw working with, I mean, I may well go back into working with investors, but more for the relationship now, you know, the good guys and girls that you, you really go through tough as well as good projects with. But I always saw um, JVs and flipping with JV money as a, a period of time um, which would allow them to earn really good money from my work, which is good for them, and allow me to earn really good money, which then allowed me to buy my portfolio, which then now I've got properties that are paid off, so now I'm own bank. So I never saw um, working with JV partners as kind of a lifetime thing. So we might just have a slightly different take on it, and there's nothing right or wrong with either take. I always saw it as it will have a finite period. I don't know how long it would be, but it would, and, and I've I've paid all my people off, you know, so, um, and now my own bank, I can raise money out of my unencumbered properties, but I always had a view that there would be an end date to it, but I just didn't know when, when I was doing it. Yeah, so it's interesting, as you say, there's nothing right or wrong with, with either approach. It's really what works for, you know, you and I as individuals and the people that we're JVing with, I suppose. Yes. And the, the other thing, of course, without being terribly sort of, um, you're giving away a lot of money. 
you know, and I mean that with kindness, but you, you know, if you're, if you're giving away 50% of the profit, there's a point when you've probably made enough money that you could then afford to do the deals yourself and kind of go, well, on this one, I might just do it myself. You know what I mean? And then, yeah. and then again, you escalate quicker and quicker. So it's kind of from deal packaging to flipping um, with JV partners to flipping on your own um, is the kind of lovely ladder. And you can still, you know, in the end, I just flipped with certain partners because I really liked working with them. It, and what it allowed me to do, it allowed me to add more onto the flipping strategy than I could afford to do myself. But it meant that I was doing ones myself, but also I had extra cash coming in from 50-50 splits. Um, but, but they got there because they were really nice people and we'd worked together before. That's, I mean, that's good to hear. And I think that's great, uh, a really good example of what, you know, again, what can be achieved in, through hard work and you know, dedication and really numbers as a people business and a, a numbers business. Um, just thinking of rolling back to the first few flips that you've done, uh, people might be concerned about how do you manage a build team or things to look out for. So how did you how did you get through your first few flips and did you manage a builder? Was someone else doing that? Give us a bit of an insight. Shoestring, shoestring, no cost going out unless necessary. No, um, I, I, was, um, I managed uh, the builders myself. Um, There's a really good contract, Minorworks contract, jct.com. It costs you about 36 quid if you do it online and 70 odd quid if you download it. Um, use the Minorworks one with your builder. Obviously, check your builder's got insurance, uh, check their membership of whatever body they say they are, and then go on site to the other projects, not necessarily to see the quality of the work, although you are the number one indicator of a builder is um is their site tidy is the site tidy and organized because there's nothing more frustrating than a bunch of guys on site you know um, the painter's paint is a bad finish because the plasterer didn't sweep up after himself and you're like well why didn't you sweep up before you painted not my job so you're really looking for people who run tidy sites and yeah i just go on site at seven o'clock i go on site at eight o'clock i go on site at three o'clock i'd be on site every second day mi minimum um, not for long uh, but just checking in, you know, making sure things are going smoothly. Um, at one point, I was doing all the ordering as well, although I handed that over after about 20 projects because that was just a bit hectic. And then, you know, you know and they don't tell you at three o'clock, you know, what they needed for eight o'clock the next day. You're like, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and where would you like me to get that now? Okay, great. I'll go and drive to the counter, you know. So I was very hands-on in the early days and it helped me learn quite a bit as well. And in the early days, again, I employed individual trades. And then later on, what I had was I had three building firms that worked with me. One worked 100% with my work. The other two were about 50 and 30% very roughly of their work was my work. And then I had nine building firms that I was testing out on small projects just to see the, how they'd behave. Um, so to see whether they could turn up on time, give me paperwork on time, have a good attitude and leave a tidy, a tidy job. So, for example, I've got a major, um, I'm doing some major renovations this year and next year, you know, millions of pounds worth of property. So I put a building firm in, in to just move a door, uh, put in a frame, re-plaster uh, re and repaint. Right. And they didn't do a particularly brilliant job. But, you know, I do accept that occasionally doors stick although I wasn't very impressed and they moaned like you've never heard to go back. And it was like, wow, obviously I didn't say to them, I'm thinking you just lost like hundreds of thousand pounds worth of building work because you can't, you can't refix a job that you haven't done properly in the first place without moaning. I don't want that near me. You know, I want people who love their work and would be mortified. Oh, you know, you've either got laborers with tools or you've got tradesmen. And I love a tradesman who loves his craft. You know, that's the kind of builders I want to work with. And then the other thing I would definitely give advice to your guys if they're new, obviously start in small scale projects, and, um, but do appreciate that a builder that runs a 20 or a 10 or a five, you know, a 10 to a 50 grand renovation is not the same animal that runs 150 grand to quarter of a million renovation. They simply won't have the same management skills, the same project management skills, the same man management skills. So don't think you can grow your builder from a 20 grand project to a 250 grand project because they probably just won't be able to stretch 
I say this with pain because I did. It went horribly wrong and I lost quite a bit of money as a result of it. Um, and I lost a really great builder. Um, now, ultimately, it's their responsibility, but I assumed that the same skill set was applicable to a 10 times project. It so isn't. You want a different beast for a different beast. That's great advice. That's really good to know as well. And we, we touched about we touched on about local area and things like that. What if someone was, again, hypothetically, someone starting out in London, they're based in London, but they've decided to invest in Leeds uh, and then they've got doing some flips and leads. Number one, does that principle work? And number two, if so, how how would you how would that person look to manage effectively from a distance? I would try and encourage them not to do it, but let's just say they were stubborn and decided to do it. Then they've got to get A-listers in their team. They've got to recruit really well for their builders. So they can't just go, I'll find a builder. It's, it, they need to really assess that builder very, very carefully and test that builder, um, take references, go see sites, you know, really make sure this is a builder because you're putting a heck of a lot of trust. I mean, mind I said that when I was doing, when I do flips, I'm on site every second day. Um, these days, because I do higher level flips, I pay project managers, so uh, they have the responsibility. But, but in the early stages, you know, you're doing everything yourself, and you cannot be on site. So you've really got to recruit extremely well for the right builder. And I think the number one indicator is: are they a craftsman? Do they do they talk about projects with huge amount of pride? Um, now, there's a risk in that. That could be that they then become slow and are too expensive because there's that quality, speed and cost triangle and you're trying to get to the sweet spot of all three, aren't you? And if somebody talks about projects with huge amounts of pride, then there might be quality and cost, uh, quality and then everything else is dead. You know, the cost is huge and the speed is very slow. Um, but you just want somebody who's got pride in their work. That, you know, that's a joy to work with. Uh, um, and you want very clear contracts. However, I'd strongly encourage, and then you want to be, I'm afraid you're jumping on a train every weekend, going to see your project and maybe midweek as well on a Wednesday night and then getting back to London four in the morning, you know. So I would much rather the person worked within their local area. Me, all of my houses are 17 minutes, apart from obviously when I'm in Glasgow where my son went to college, but that's 15 minutes from my parents' house. Um, all of my houses are within 17 minute drive time of my, both my house and my office. Why? Because it's hugely efficient. I mean, I've got houses one minute from each other. Why? Because it's hugely efficient. So at the moment, I'm going to do um, two HMOs. I'm, um, I'm going up into the loft. I've got... Um, um, uh, the legal agreement from the council to extend up into the loft for uh, loft. And then what I'm going to do once the loft space is created, I'm going to turn them into flats uh, because then you get a big, bigger loft space. Well, they're like two minutes away from each other. So I'm going to run the projects concurrently and the efficiency on that is huge. And the, everyone thinks that the deal is the major thing because when you've not done that many deals, it's such a big mindset thing to burst through. Oh my God, I find a deal. But actually, you're going to be commuting to that deal every day, every second day. So very quickly, the day-to-day -day operational management becomes more important, which is like why I like efficiency. I'd have it as close to home as possible if you could, if you've qualified for 250,000 population and over 100, 000, 100 estate agents. Makes perfect sense. Do it on your home patch, know your patch, crack on and knuckle, knuckle down. A couple of, a couple of other questions and we'll wrap up with a bit of quick fire, um, if that's okay with you. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you beat me to it already. I don't even need to read the questions now. What would you say the, um, what would you say the advantages of doing flipping are in comparison to other strategies? What are the advantages of, of flipping? Just plain, simple cash. It's big, big lump sums of cash. Now, for some folks, they go fund a lifestyle with it. For me, I put every penny into a property portfolio, so I'm now financially free, and that'll be me for the rest of my life. Um, it's the big, big lump sums of cash that come in. Uh, most of my cash just stayed with my lawyers because the cash will come in on a Friday morning and go back out two hours later to buy another house. You know, um, yeah, I'll just say it one more time. Cash. <laughs> That's fine, loud and clear. We like that. <laughs> yes. So what would you say... If there are any disadvantages of 
doing this in comparison to other uh, cash flow <laughs> um, and that's where jv's come in um so on average i will i will uh, my my record uh, is five and a half months between cash going into the property and cash coming back out of the property but i would always tell everybody count on get your cash back out nine months later because in the industry average is one in three deals fall out of bed now me i got it to nine out of ten because i conveyance like a little banshee but if you if you are going to have one in three you've got a high statistical likelihood that your buyers are going to fall out of bed they're either going to fall out of bed on week one which is very polite of them or more likely the little buggers are going to fall out of bed 12 weeks into the process just before they're about to buy and that does happen. So then that adds 11 weeks more to your flipping strategy, which you've now been paying for bridging or, you know, interest or whatever the heck. So, um, so always count on your cash coming back on nine months. And then if it comes back early and I was averaging five and three quarter months, then that's great. Um, so it's, it's, it's about predicting your cash flow for about 18 months hence, uh, because, because it's going to cost you, you know, deposit money, renovation cash, and then maintenance before the cash comes back in. Um, so that's why I liked running flipping. I mean, at one point I had 30 flips on the go and they're a mix of my own cash and JV finance because the JV finance was work, but no cash from me. And then my own cash, obviously I got double the profit. Um, and, and the reason I mixed it was I predicted my cash flow and went, ah, <laughs> if I did all these myself, I'd be stuffed. <laughs> you know, I'd run out of money halfway through, so I better not, uh, which is why I shared the profit with people. So cash flow is the downside. So measure your cash flow and cash, pure, straightforward cash is the upside. And it's good fun. That's well, yeah. So I think you, you have to have some enjoyment in, in doing it. If you don't enjoy doing it, what's, what's the point? The, the sales process, I know you spoke about photographs and staging and the fact that you know let's be honest women are going to be better at that than men in, you know generally possibly hmm, carry no bunny ears and all that in in terms of how that process works with what stage would you start advertising marketing the property for sale is it, is it after the first three days when you've got some cgis how how do you how do you do that? It depends. Um, we've had some interesting experiences if we've advertised it too early for sale. We built a house once and we advertised it for sale really early. And we just very unfortunately happened upon a very interesting buyer who, who kind of had... So, so I'm a bit wary of that because that, that particular buyer kind of... Um, felt that they were going to totally redesign the house. Now, in the end, we didn't sell it to that person because they were just too much hard work. But, you know, we had weekly project meetings with them and you end up just going, love, it's only one, you know, it's only one house and this is the kitchen. <laughs> this is the garden, you, you know. And, and I think what they'd done is they had reinterpreted our ability to be a little bit flexible with um, we're buying from Barrett's. And so there are 10 kitchens I can choose from you know, and it's like, no, there aren't. <laughs> so um, I actually, what I do is if I'm going to sell back through an estate agent, which sometimes I will do, I'll get the estate agent in on day one of the refurb to go, what do you think we should do? You know, do, do we leave strip floorboards or do we carpet? Do we leave the fireplace? Do we put in gallow brackets and take the chimney out? What does the buyer in this particular quarter of my location want? Because this is where you're the expert, dear estate agent. And often they'll give really great advice. Um, but then what I'll do is I'll have the photographer. First off, I get my builders and they, this is not their favorite part of it, but there you go, guys. Welcome to my world. My builders are, are also contracted to to put up the staging furniture because builders are like builders and they're like, right, we've done the project, white walls, beige carpet. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There's um, sofas to be put in here and wardrobes. So, so I'll get the builders, their job finishes when this, when all the furniture is in. Um, and then we'll take, we'll get a photographer. I mean, literally the paint is not dry. We'll get a photographer and we'll spend hundred, 150 pounds, a really good photographer. And then it goes up on the market uh, because then you've got a finished product. Um, and, uh, and I either sell through estate agents or I often sell directly, um, use uh, websites like I am the .com. It's a lot cheaper. Um, if you like people and like selling and enjoy houses, it's great fun. If you don't want to go near your customers, then definitely go through an estate agent. But the reason to get the agent in in the first place is they love stories. So they love selling something they've seen before you renovated it to afterwards. And then if you're selling something that's really interesting, you can also 
to create a, a sale file in the house. You can do the before and afterwards. You can you can produce all the certification. Obviously, they can't take it away when they're just viewing, but you can produce some very nice designs. So I'm old school. I like people to see the physical product because you do tend to find that generally the public can't imagine something unless the cushions are fluffy, you know, and the fire looks good. So I want them to see the dream because you're selling a home and home is love and affection and comfort and safety and security and fun and food and happiness and you know, sex. You know, um, we always put a tray on the bed uh, with uh, with um, coffee and um, as laid out. And I always thought I was selling breakfast in bed. And my agent was like, no, Suze, you're selling sex in bed. I'm like, whoa. So we put one in every <laughs> single bite to sell that we've ever sold. <laughs> and I mind going to my hairdresser once and she was like, oh, I love looking at properties. I know which ones are yours. Because they've always got the sex tray. So that's what we call it now, the sex tray. <laughs> got to know what you're selling. Uh, that's brilliant. I love that. That's absolutely great. Uh, no, no further comment. I just love, I love it. I think that's <laughs> super. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, training. We'll, yeah, at the end, we'll guide people on how people can find you. But when, when you're training and mentoring people, what are the uh, common queries that you hear from people that are just starting out on this property? Well, common queries and common concerns. Builders, but you've covered that. That's definitely, um, you know, how do I find, how do I manage a builder? It's a scary mo thing for people. But, um, and I think it's that whole thing of, you know, a builder's rip-offs. Well, I've only had two rip-off builders in all the deals I've done, you know, and that's not bad. Um, and then the other one that people are quite scared about, that um, I feel uncomfortable about is the funding for, for buy to sell. So we've talked a lot about private finance, but the thing we haven't maybe introduced yet is bridging. Now you say the word bridging and people are like, oh my God. But the reality is if the thing is too knackered to get a mortgage, then it's highly likely you're going to need to use bridging. And once you, I mean, the person needs to have a competent whole of market commercial broker to find a good quality bridge for them. You know, that is ultimately them recruiting a good quality team, including a professional advisor. But typically people will be paying kind of 8.76% with, you know, maybe a, a one or 2% fees. Um, I like my guys to take a bridge for 18 months. I do not want them on that bridge for 18 months. Oh my God, I'd go mental if they were. But I like people to take... If they are going to take a bridge, then they make sure that there's no redemption fees or maybe there's like a £200 admin fee at the back end. It means you can pay it back early. Uh, but it also, I don't like people taking a nine-month bridge because then you've got penalty fees if for whatever reason the project stalled or whatever. So I like people to have breathing space within a bridge but be able to pay it back early. So I think unless people are kind of, like for me, I'm really com comfortable taking bridging because it's just another financial instrument but I think that freaks people out until they start to realize it's not the big bogeyman it's a little bit more expensive but the reason it's more expensive is a it's short term so they're not going to earn money off you for the next 25 years like a mortgage company does and b they may well be taking a risk because the property may be a bit knackered and um, so they'd have to fire sell it if you screwed up on it whereas a mortgage company is you know it's a house they're probably going to sell it quite easily if you screw up on it and one of the advantages, uh, again, is something you mentioned at the start and you run your business by, your numbers. So if you've done enough research and you've done enough homework and you are pretty confident it's all going to be okay, uh, nine times out of ten it will probably be okay, but I mean, something bonkers happening. So any other top tips on bridging while we're on the subject? Um, get a whole of market broker and then work out the costs based on a year. Um, but but knowing you're highly likely to have paid it back by month nine. And then the other thing is speed. Um, I'm, because again, I was a retailer, like, like, um, like nothing stays in a warehouse for me. Like has, when I had, I had five shops and I had no storage, I refused to have storage and it was a nightmare for my staff. I don't care because if it's in storage, it's, it's not making any money. So we must order just in time. It's Kaizen theory. It's the Japanese manufacturing theory. And I'm the same for property. If I buy it on a Friday, I need, I need my guys in on, so I'm pointing at you. I need, see, <laughs> I'm getting hit up here. I need my guys in on the Monday. Like there is no chance. Uh, there's only one project I've not done this on, which is the chapel. Every other project, the day I buy it, the guys are in that afternoon or the next day, the next working day. It, it, just, just, it just does not happen anything other than there is no waste of time and then it's fast fast, fast. 
boom, 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 boom. So you move, you've got to be tight on project management. I, I, I will not have a site that isn't being worked on. You know, it's got to be stock turn, stock turn, stock turn. Um, and I think occasionally I see people buying properties to flip and then say, oh, I'm going to find a builder now. And I'm like tearing my hair out. What? You know, you need to have had that builder. You need to have had your three quotes like six weeks in advance. You need to have set out the contract with the builder. And okay, you know, sometimes the exchange date, the completion date moves by a week. So, so uh, I would always give, you know, ask the builder's flexibility, but that builder needs to be in the day after you've bought it and, and fast. And then, and then small money saving things don't have the builder putting his chippy and his sparky. They, they'd probably refuse to do it. The sparky would, but don't have uh, the plasterer ripping the place out. The, the builder needs to have like apprentices ripping the place out, you, you know, and uh, because you, you've got to be saving money where you can. Oh yeah. Sorry. The third mistake. Has, so people are scared of bridging and they're scared of running a team, a builder or they're, nervous about it because it's some outside their experience and then um a big mistake i see people doing is they refurb it for the, uh, themselves and i'll tell a story against myself the first project i bought sat, um, in wellington avenue uh, seventy nine thousand. i rented it for a few years and then i sold it for 120 little tiny little one bed flat not even one bed it was, what was like a bedroom a bathroom and a kitchen diner and that was it and i put in fire and ball paint um but the paint was cream. So it was about four times as expensive as normal paint. And my, 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 my builder was just laughing at me quite correctly because I can't even remember the color of it, but it was just cream, right? It was magnolia, but it was fair and ball, darling. You know, and that's what people do. They overspend. So for flipping, um, if I can get a certificate for the boiler, I'll never change the boiler. If I can paint the windows, I'll never change the windows. If I can repair the roof, I'll never change the roof. Whereas for buy to let, I would, you know, if the boiler was old, I would just go, do you know what? I'm going to get it done now because I've got this house for 25 years. I'm going to get the roof done now because I don't want leaks and tenants complaining later on. I'm going to do the windows if, I, if they really need to be done, whereas I would just paint over for a flipping. So I don't invest on what I would call the no fun dental spend that nobody notices, but you've had to spend three grand on, you know, I don't do that unless it's absolutely necessary because nobody says, ah, a new boiler, I'm going to offer you three grand more. They go, oh, it's beautiful. I'll offer you three grand more. True. Very, very okay. true. That, that's, yeah, it's good to have those differences. Uh, again, that's actually one of the quick fast. So we've not one Oops, the quick fast answer. No, no, it's, it's, it's great thinking on the same wavelength. So the good thing to know is when you're going into when you're going into that, there are some subtle differences between your, your strategies there, which is there are. Yeah. which is great. Perfect. Yeah, like like a kitchen in a flip. If it's there already, all I'm going to do is replace the knobs and replace the worktop, and then get the the the, the guys to repaint the doors. Whereas I might replace the kitchen if it was a bite to let because it's, it's fine. That's good. That's good. That's just, and you know, th these are things that I imagine that you've learned over time because you've done so many and you know, this yeah. is all stuff that you wouldn't have got on property number one. You've taken no. your lessons and learned and learned and learned. And that's, that's a key thing for anyone listening as well. Yeah. Rolling into some quick fire. Okay, well, let's and go. What would you say the... What would you say you've learned most from being in property? That it's possible. Literally, it's possible. If someone else has done it, you can do it. Because there's nothing super special about them, even if they're amazing at what they do. If they can do it, you can do it. Where do you see this strategy flipping being in the future? Is it still going to exist? Is it always going to be here? Always going to be here. People want beautiful homes whether they're downsizers and they never want to pick up another paintbrush or whether they're millennials and they want the Instagram perfect home. People want beautiful homes. Yeah. Provide it for them and, and take, take your, take your wage. You've given out a lot of great information. If you had to summarize your top three tips for people getting involved in this strategy, what would your top three tips be? Okay. First one is just so classic. I'm afraid to say Get on and do it. Just do it. Do it. There's never a good time to do it. Just do it, right? Second one is assets paying bills. So I love the flipping strategy, but I love it because it allowed me to build my portfolio. I view the... So in the early days, it was the it was underneath. It, it allowed me to build my portfolio. Now it's the cherry on top. So 
create a property portfolio. Like I work two hours a week on my properties. That is it. I've had my meeting today with Hannah. That was an hour. I'll do another hour this week and that's it. You know, um, so those assets, I'm financially free uh, as long as I don't think completely stupid for the rest of my life. So assets pay bills. And the third one that f- flipping, it donates cash, you know, it donates cash into the assets or into toys and life is blooming short, you know. It really is. So flip some properties and enjoy your life with it. Like I turn left into airplanes now, you know, I upgraded upgrade, my best mate last year, which was just a laugh to see him going, oh my God, have you seen the cocktail bar? And I had to be like, <laughs> yes, I have, <laughs> you know, you know, like that's from flipping, you know, happy birthday. We're turning left. On top of that, is there any final words of encouragement, any words of wisdom from yourself? Oh, I just want to wish everybody good luck. Uh, oh, yes. And the, the, probably the other piece of practical advice is write yourself a plan. Because I often find by writing it down, whether you write it in a way that I do, which is quite, you know, checkbox and tick off, or my friend Tina, um, she calls KPIs no sues. They're not called KPIs. They're just things I have to get done. Do you see? Very different brain. So she does hers, sit on cushions and writes a mind map. Write it down because I think often that can then help you see the gaps and your gaps are always going to be time, money and skills. And you can all solve all three of those gaps. So if you write it down, it starts to become real. Um, and then of course you're like, oh sugar, I can't do it because, and then you have to go, how can I solve that? And I've, I find, I find that quite useful. Having the problem solving mentality is key. Yeah. Absolutely key. Uh, and then finally, how do people get hold of you? Uh, Cause you mentioned you have multiple services that you can offer people. How do people find you? Cool. Um, if they want to have fun. Uh, watch the YouTube channel. We've got way over a million views now. So the good property company, Susanna Cole. Uh, and then there's loads of, you know, just go fill your boots with free vids and they're all divided up, as you can imagine. So there's a flipping uh, a, a, a section. Um, and then, uh, and again, if they want to just have a peek, Instagram's good, Facebook's good, LinkedIn's good, or give us an email, info at thegoodpropertycompany.co.uk um, but any other socials we'll pick it up um, I do have a code I mean I, I love I do webinars and I do training and I do I've got very high quality online library of, of, of education I love the detail as you can probably tell and I love I love it when other people succeed but I also or and I also have a code now and you and I both like travel and it's Bali Villa if I can't run any of my businesses from a villa in Bali with crappy internet I can't do it so it has to be doesn't it it has it has to be asset based it has to be you know if I can't if I have to hold the phone up high because I'm in the villa in Bali in the middle of the jungle you know so that's why I'm saying email rather than phone just in case I'm in the villa (laughs) that's great and as usual uh, we'll put all of the links in the show notes as well uh, for those listening on the podcast Uh, if you're reading this in the book then it's just beneath this bit of text uh, well Susanna that's been incredibly insightful really really useful and I love the not, not just the passion but the inspiration I think you're going to provide people that listen to this so uh, thank you for your time and really wish you all the best moving forward and you with yours as well It'd be fun to see whether we find each other in some travel somewhere and talk about property and entrepreneurialism sounds good to me I'll see you in Bali <laughs> Bali Villa woohoo <laughs>